always has to disrupt the audience before I come on. <laughs> so I've got to do the gain and maintain attention. Right, well, I have the absolutely fantastic job of introducing to you Andrea Zafiraku, who is the Valky Foundation's winner of the 2018 Global Teacher Prize, what some people call the Nobel Prize for Teaching, so no pressure there. Um, but the scale of her teaching is that she won this for, for more than 30,000 entries. I spoke to her the other day. She'd just come back from Argentina. Yesterday, she was at the UN in Geneva. Um, and so her feet haven't touched the ground. What I'm going to just try and do for you is capture some of her incredible strengths and to paint a small picture for you of our keynote speaker. She's then going to speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then there'll be a short period, I don't know how short, uh, for questions. So let me begin. She spent her 13-year career at Alberton Community Secondary School in Brent in London. She started there as a newly qualified teacher. She was then promoted to the Deputy Head of Art within her first year and is now a senior leader. She's teaching some of the most disadvantaged and ethnically diverse children in the country. I'm going to take a number of themes just to try and capture Andrea as a teacher. First of all, the importance of the arts. She teaches arts and textiles. But she's concerned, like I do, even as a science educator, about, about the fact that many of our schools are now teaching, focusing on the sciences and not on the arts. And some schools are, have given up teaching the arts altogether. But she sees arts as significantly contributing to many life skills that those that are needed by her students. She also believes that teaching the arts gives a window into her pupils' lives and backgrounds. And this has led to visits to the students' homes, which has helped Andrea understand their family lives. And understanding pupils in the widest possible sense is something I'll return to. In an article in The Guardian, I've done my research, I'm quoting her directly now, and she's talking about her concerns that arts are not at the heart of the curriculum when she says, how are those children going to nourish themselves and find ways of letting their anxieties out or being happy, being creative, socialising and building skills of resilience and perseverance? I now take you on to the dealing with deprivation. The area in which Andrea teaches is subject to very significant levels of deprivation and gang violence haunts the school gates. And so she is teaching in an area where children's lives are uncertain, subject to random acts of violence, and society is changing. In her words, this is how she describes deprivation. Deprivation is when you have got six or seven separate families living in one house, sleeping one family to a room, sharing one bathroom, and rotating the use of the kitchen. I had a girl who was truanting in my class, so I investigated and found it was because she had to go home during the day and cook for her family because that was a slot on her rota for cooking. So how has she responded? She doesn't just know this, she responds. She's actually done washing for her students. She's provide, the school provides free breakfast. She's set up a female cricket club for girls. She's rescheduled after-school clubs for the weekend so those kids with domestic duties can actually attend. And she actually personally escorts them off the premises of, um, to the buses at the end of the day because of the gang violence. My final theme, just to capture uh, Andrea for you, is celebrating diversity, and it picks up on some of the themes uh, in the introduction. Andrea herself has taught herself phrases in 35 languages. I'm not going to test you on that, by the way. <laughs> I take that. She's concerned, like I am, about criticisms in some sections of society that multiculturalism is seen as a problem, or at worst, a dangerously failed experiment. She sees it as a key role of teachers to really get to know the personal background and lives of the students she's teaching, to see how different and complex they are. And she sees diversity and valuing diversity as a strength. Again, in her own words, when they, the students, come into this huge intimidating building, if you say to them, namaste or vonacom, you see their faces light up. It means that you get them that you're interested in them, that you are welcome in them, and that you appreciate their identity, their background, and they glow. So what is teaching about? This is what Andrea says, that it's all about building relationships. Instead of worrying about the teaching the curriculum or making sure that you've got strict classroom environment, build your relationships first. Get your kids on board, connect with them, find out what it is they're interested in. Build the relationship, build that trust, and then everything else can happen. 
In summary, what I've tried to distill for you is some of the many outstanding qualities Andrea brings to teaching and what she's going to now share with you in her keynote street speech. Understanding the students and their families and making that a cause for celebration, seeing her students and parents as a rich resource and not in deficit and seeing diversity as a resource and not a point for conflict and resolution or suspicion. I have the greatest pleasure in introducing you and we have the title up there and we look forward to you talking to us. Thank you. Hello everyone, I don't think I need to talk anymore because Anne basically has told you what my <laughs> keynote was about. <laughs> but it's lovely to be here and Eid Mubarak to the Minister. Um, it's quite uh, astonishing to stand here in front of you all with this title here being um, the Global Teacher Prize winner. Um, yeah. <laughs> the best teacher? No. Um, I don't think, to be honest with you, there is such a word and a title as the best teacher in the world. This can't exist because what makes a good teacher? Is it the results or is it the work that you put in to make sure that every child achieves in your classroom, in your community? And there are outstanding practitioners all over the world. One of them is just sitting opposite me, who I know very well, who are doing tremendous work in their communities. Luckily, I was recognised, and that's why I'm here today in front of you all um, presenting um, my story, presenting about the work that I do. Um, as uh, Dr Johnson said, uh, it's time to confront the truths. So I think I'd like to tell you some of the truths that I have experienced on this last three-month journey being the Global Prize uh, Teacher Prize winner but also through my um, experiences of being a teacher in my particular school. So a little bit about myself. I come from a migrant background. I was born in the UK. My family came from, um, my, my father's from Greece and my mother came from Cyprus. Um, and the thing that I believe, the core of what my beliefs are in terms of what makes a good teacher is my upbringing. So I, my family, um, you know, obviously we were in we were in London, and London at the time is, and is now is a very diverse country. But what the Greek Cypriots believe is the power of family, the, the importance of family, and I think that's what makes my job quite simple. Because when I don't see it from when I if in, in the classroom or within my school, I'm able to identify and hopefully put things in place. So, just some some experiences that I've had over the last three months. Um, I was lucky enough to meet many ministers of education, meet many teachers from all over the world. Um, and some of the things and experiences which are problems uh, and challenges which these countries are facing are not too dissimilar to ours here. So for example, number one, the value of the teaching profession in their societies. This is something that many countries are experiencing. The levels of migration, and what do you do when you have a child in your classroom who you cannot engage with, who you're not able to deliver the cur curriculum because they cannot speak the language. Levels of deprivation in the nearby environment. Quality education. How do we know that our teachers and the experiences that our students are having is of the best quality that we can provide. And lastly, the lack of investment in quality teacher training, not just when they are starting their careers as teachers, but throughout. So, and I think that for me is something I'm quite passionate about, is ensuring that the professional development of a teacher in the classroom does not stop just before, or just um, stop when they graduate their, uh, their teaching um, qualification. So going back to look at the question which um, Dr. Johnson said, uh, time to confront the truths. This is a little bit about my, my truths. Um, this is a snapshot of the area that I work with and I work in a school in Alperton um, and it's, it's in the, it's in the um, location of Brent in London and um, it's a very very diverse area and 
if I was to reflect what I think is very passionate about and what, what I love about where I work is that it's extremely diverse and that there are always lots of challenges that we are faced with. And I don't know um, if this is a, a, a me thing or if there's a general teacher thing, but I think that my job as a senior leader, as a teacher, is to problem solve. And that's what I constantly seem to be doing. But um, recently, I was shocked. And I was shocked because um, a teacher, not, not, not um, from the UK, but from somewhere else in the world, asked me two questions. The first question was, do you think that girls should be educated? Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine my reaction to that. And the second question, which a teacher said, was, do you think that all can achieve? So if I, was, if I was to take you back to my particular school community, this is the one thing that drives us all. This is the one thing. We are, and we are committed to the achievement of our children, to the fact whereby one of our girls is here in Oxford. Um, it's her second year, and she's studying medicine. We're really proud. And I know I won't be able to see her today, but um, my vibes are going out to her. Um, and that's a, that, that, that's a testimony of what we can do in our schools. So a bit, a bit about London. So London, as you know, is a very diverse area um, in my particular region, Brent. Brent is an area whereby we have got the most um, um, uh, varieties and percentages of BAME populations, 63.7%, um, um, and that's in contrast to the rest of the UK, which is 14%. Um, it is a it's an area where there's high deprivation, um, lots of um, gang activity that takes place outside our school gates. Um, many of our students and parents do come from poverty uh, and deprived backgrounds. Uh, we have high levels of migration. I can go on, I can go on. Um, you get the picture. The best thing about my school is that it's beautifully diverse, and you can see from these happy students in our background. On our road in our school, just outside our road, it's a road that stretches about one mile. And on that road, you will find three churches, one temple, and two mosques. That's, that gives you a great picture of, of the community that we're in. So what do we do in our school to make a difference? Well, we, we just make sure that whatever the problems are which the students are facing, that does not enter the classroom. We put things in place for them. We will give them breakfast, because many of our students will not have had breakfast. Um, many of our students are carers. They will go home after school straight away, not being able to stay to any of the uh, clubs, because they need to pick up their brothers and sisters, or they need to go home, prepare the family meal, because their families can't, or they're not, or they're not there because they're working. Some of our children are completely responsible for themselves. They will not see an adult, because their mum or their dad are working the night shift. So we are the parents, we are the social workers, we are the carers, we, we do everything um, that we can to make sure that they have got a fantastic experience and a high quality education, which we, do ne which we never, ever, ever jeopardise. So in terms of what, I, what, I, what Anne said my passions are, and that's arts and the power of the arts and how arts have transformed lives. And I'll give you two stories or two scenarios. Yes, we experience the cases whereby we have children coming to our schools who do not speak any, um, any, any English whatsoever. And um, Dr. Johnson ref um, spoke to us about some um, the Syrian refugees. I recently, a month ago, interviewed um, a lovely family who came to our school from Syria. Um, the father and the mother were both doctors in their countries. And the children were very, you know, obviously could not speak any English, but they were high achieving students. We can tell that. We, and the, re, the way that we were able to notice this was through their exposure of the arts, PE, drama, music. These are subjects which really help to identify students' strengths, their identity, uh, enable them to build resilience, enable them to, to, to um, have leadership skills, enable them to be themselves and explore their own identities. So this is why I'm always quite passionate about um, advocating the arts. And I think for me, what is more important about the arts subjects is how inclusive they are. 
I have had the pleasure of working with many, many special needs students. Students who have been put on a completely different curriculum because they were not perceived to do as well as they could do. That's a mistake. That attitude has now got to change. I have been able to work with students who can get GCSEs in art. They may not be able to speak, they're selective mutes. They may not be able to write because they suffer from dy dyslexia, but oh my gosh, they can hold paintbrushes, they can draw lines, they can paint, they can express themselves. And the power of the arts in these subjects enable us to find what it is that we can help them to unlock their potentials. And this is what these subjects do. They build confidence, they build resilience, and these are what the skills are that um, almost underpin the other subjects. To the point whereby I had a maths teacher come up to me and says to me, oh my God, Andrea, what has happened to Tom? He has transformed. Tom now comes to my lesson. He's able to stay there for the whole hour. He's not angry. He's calm. All I do is he's asked me to give him some pencils that he can draw his maths equations in pencils and, and colour in the pie charts. That for me is a result. That for me shows that there is a way that we can try and support our children um, using these particular subjects. Um, oh, I love this picture. This is this is the, my year sevens. Um, they are that's that's a, a typical classroom, very diverse, very very multicultural, and yet loving and very passionate about um, their work they've achieved. So going back to to what my next steps are. So I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, along with this fantastic trophy that I've been awarded, um, I've also got a um, million dollars, um, which I'm allowed, I know. <laughs> and you just watch them all apply now. <laughs> I've also got a million dollars, and um, so this is my, this is my belief, this is what I'm going to be using that money for, because obviously, you know, I feel passionate about the fact that I've received this award, for, become, for being a teacher in my community. So what I'm going to do with this particular um, fantastic bursary is that I'm going to be um, organising a charity. And this charity is to support the arts and actors and musicians, the arts, to come into schools, to work with schools in the terms of artists in residence. Not just a one-off um, let's go in and just do one project. I want it to be a fantastic ongoing relationship because I thoroughly believe that schools are under a lot of pressure at the moment to be able to offer the arts and the curriculums. There's no time. Look, I'm a senior leader. I'm always having those conversations around the table. We're always fighting for them and I know the pressures that head teachers are having. We're, we are, how can we deliver? Students aren't able to, to um, take them up. Why are they not off, um, opting to take them up? They're not opting to take them up because of society. Society says that to become a doctor, with no, just, with no offence, to become, to become a, that, yeah, to become, to become a doctor, to become a solicitor, to become a lawyer, these are the subjects that are very meaningful and important. Well, if you're thinking about a child now who has got to pay £35,000 for their education, they're going to come out with that much amount of debt. They're thinking very carefully about their decisions. They're thinking about, actually, how, what job am I going to have? How am I going to pay off my loan? So as well as, um, as, well as my um, ambition that my project will help students um, experience the arts, but I'm also hoping that they will be able to see that there is potential in the arts, that the arts bring a lot of money in our economies, and that actually I've met quite a few um, CEOs from very big organisations that are saying, Andrea, do you know what? I've got the scientists, I've got the technicians, but I don't have the creatives. We need to get the creatives back into the curriculum. How can we help you to do this? And on that note, I think I'm going to leave it there. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first oxy and not my last. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for listening. And uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs>